Well, it is a pleasure once again to welcome back into the basement, so to speak. It is Bash in the Basement. Todd Marinovich is joining us once again. Todd, it has been too long. It's been, I think, five years since we had you on. How's it going? You're out here uh, in Hawaii living. You look great. How are you, my friend? I am in a very good place, literally, and um, also in a good place uh, internally and emotionally spiritually it's uh i've never been better so thanks clint for having me on i really enjoyed our last visit i can't believe five years have passed but um time flies it does and you you look tremendous and you've moved to hawaii uh, just a couple months ago what brought you to hawaii other than like the obvious uh i mean so i'm going on a hawaiian cruise like in uh in in a few months so like may maybe i'll see you out there i can't wait i've never been so what what brought you to Hawaii other than just like, oh, well, it's the, you know, most beautiful place on earth. There is that. <laughs> I couldn't agree more. Um, the main reason for my exodus from California um, is my son, Baron. He is 13 year old, years old. He's an aspiring quarterback. And I knew this when he started playing flag football about the age of nine that there was no way that I was going to subject him to playing football in Orange County like I did with the last name Marinovich and playing quarterback I thought that would be completely unfair to him and so for the last five years I knew I was needing to move my first thought was Oregon because I used to we as a family used to live up there but um always loved Hawaii um, our family lived here back in the seventies when my dad was coaching the old world football league, the Hawaii Hawaiians. So that was my first taste. Um, but I wanted him to have his own experience with football without all my baggage. Um, and so that was the reason. And I, I couldn't be uh, more happy and yeah, I'm stoked. I'm stoked to be here. It does seem like there would be somewhat less pressure, you know, playing uh, high school football in Hawaii versus, say, a modern day where you played, where you were from day one, like <laughs> right in the mix. Yeah. And yeah. And, and when I got here, I, the only people I know are on Oahu. And when I flew into Oahu, I absolutely knew that that wasn't the island. Uh, hmm. In the 70s, maybe it was, but not anymore. And so I took a flight uh, to Kauai. And the last time I was there was in uh, my senior year in high school. I went with my closest friend, Tommy Tracy. And it was amazing. I mean, Hawaii is, or Kauai is how you would picture Hawaii. I mean, Fantasy Island. Um, but on my trip there, it felt uh, really tight. And I was picturing myself driving these roads on a daily basis. And I went, I can't do that. And I thought I've never been to the big island. And so I booked a flight. And that's what's great. Once you get here, flights from island to island are pretty dang cheap. And they run every hour. And so no shit. When I got off the plane in Kona, I took my first breath. And I knew I was home. I love that. And I just love to see you in, in such a happy place Todd that just it just really makes me feel good because we've had you on so uh you know it's been, like I said it's been quite a while but just to see you like this you're just smiling ear to ear you're, you're looking wonderful and you live in Hawaii I can't think of a more perfect place for for you to be this is great and um I do want to bring this up because you are the the people don't realize we've had a, a guest on our show over the years that you that you know and his name is Patrick Muldoon you played college football with him at USC. And for those that don't realize Patrick Muldoon is yes, Jeff from saved by the bell, the frat boy, babe stealer that stole Kelly away from Zach. Tell us about Patrick Muldoon as a football player. I believe he was a tight end for you there at USC. <laughs> I, I probably shouldn't, but I am going to tell you a story. Please. I, <laughs> Patrick is a great human being and I love him to death. But there is a story that was shocking to me when I witnessed this. Um, so we're 
playing at home in the Coliseum, and it's halftime. And it's weird. Before games, I had this feeling like, do I have to piss? No, I don't have to piss. Do I? And you have all that gear on, and it's it's a nightmare if you have to use the bathroom. And so I come in at halftime, and I really got to piss. And there is Patrick blow drying his hair, <laughs> so he looks good for the la- for the ladies on the sidelines. And I about died. Um, of course, I went out of the uh, bathroom and into the locker room and pulled his covers, because um, that's what we do as teammates. We uh, make fun of each other and laugh <laughs> with each other. Um, so. He's probably not going to be stoked on me saying this. Uh, however, it was the truth. And, I mean, he's great looking. So I, he, has, he had to keep it together. Yeah, there's sort of an aura about playing at USC anyway. The beautiful campus, the women. I mean, it just, if ever there were a place for Patrick Muldoon to have played football at, it was USC. And just, again, <laughs> I, I can't reiterate enough. I mean, he's been he's been in some really good stuff. I mean, he was in that movie Arkansas a couple years ago. That's really good. Like, do you do you ever keep up with uh, with Patrick or like see any of his movies or anything? Because he's a, he's a good dude, man. Like you said, he is a good dude, and I uh, stay up to date with him through social media, which yeah. is really cool. And um, and I knew back then that he was going to do something, you know, do well. He just had that vibe about him and the way he carried himself. And uh, it's not a surprise that he's doing well. Well, that's a really great story. And I'm definitely going to have to um, clip this out, send that to him and said, Todd Marinovich has kind of <laughs> blown the curtain by. I want to ask you something about USC because you played for Larry Smith, yeah. who wound up coaching. I, you know, I live in uh, Kansas City. I grew up a huge Mizzou fan. So Larry Smith comes to Missouri and kind of resurrects our program here. Right. Obviously, for you guys, it was kind of touch and go <laughs> at yeah. times. But just Larry Smith, the man, the coach, I uh, just always wanted to kind of get your thoughts on on him. We had uh, a rocky relationship. Yes. And, you know, it wasn't until um, I got into recovery that I realized and got a different perspective about Larry. And it was when I went, I flew to Tucson to make amends to the Smith family because Larry had passed away. Yeah. That was Cheryl in her home and talked for maybe three hours about stuff I had no idea about Larry. Um, and the things that she shared with me were I was his biggest regret because he just didn't know how to handle me. And I, I wouldn't have known how to handle me at the, uh, those years. And um, so I have a really soft spot in my heart for Larry. And the thing that he motivated me to do, and it was when I was sitting with Cheryl that I recognized it and realized that he called me into his office. And this was probably my second year there. And I wasn't going to class. Um, and he said, Todd, what's up? You got to go to you got to go to class to play. What, what's the deal? And I said, I hate school. Straight up. And he said, well, what do you want to do? Like, what would you do if you could do anything? And I said, art. And he says, well, why don't you do art? And I said, well, my old man and my dad is an artist. That's the crazy part that he had doubt about. And he kind of passed and that's parents pass this stuff on without even realizing it. His fear about actually having a career as an artist was unthinkable to him. Um, and so it was that day that Coach Smith said, do art. And when the head man gave me the path to go do it, I had the most fun semester I've ever had in school. I walked over to the art department and I was like, I found my people. And um, I'll never forget it. And it was really my first uh, introduction to the art world. And I did every studio class I could take from painting to ceramics, you name it. I, I just loved it. And are you still doing it? I know it's there for a while on Instagram. You had, uh, were promoting Marinovich art. Are you still kind of deeply into that and everything going yeah. okay? I know people could order even custom stuff from you. What, what's the state of Marinovich art right now? I, uh, I will always create. Um, I have been fortunate enough the past 14 years to be doing it 
uh, for a living. However, I'm reevaluating all that right now. Hmm. And I, I'm starting to think that this gift, because I've been blessed and it, it, is, it is a gift. Um, how do I charge people for a gift that's been freely given to me? Well, tell us Eddie Van Halen. (laughs) (laughs) So, in the meantime, um, idle hands aren't good for somebody like me. So I have gotten busy immediately in this beautiful community that I live in. And I'm volunteering at the high school. And Clint, I cannot tell you how good it feels because I can bring something to the table for these young uh, 13 to 16 year olds that are so hungry um, for football. And I have a lot of experience in that area. However, I am getting back so much more than I'm giving that I am so, newsflash, I have an addictive personality. (laughs) And I've heard this. (laughs) I am addicted to being of service to these kids. And I wake up thinking about them and they are so talented. And I mean, when I, when I share this with my friends, they're kind of like, oh yeah, no. I mean, like two of the quarterbacks for Miami or Marcus Mariota, they have nothing on these young kids at this point. And so with some development and some just me sharing what what I've experienced in this world of football with them, they got a chance. And it's just, I couldn't be, I can't even put it to words. I never thought that I would be a coach because I've had some great, I've had a few great coaches and a lot of other ones that come from, because football is really army, militaristic. Yes, sir, we get in freaking lines. I hated that. Um so what I'm bringing is it should be fun. And I don't stand out there for three hours talking about football. We're out there for an hour and then let's go to the beach. So um, I couldn't be having more fun, man. Todd, it sounds like what somebody maybe maybe needed to harness in you and that maybe Larry Smith sort of led you to is that football for you is best enjoyed and you can be sort of centered to the utmost when it's mixed with when you have balance in your life, other things that you like and that you love and your passions. And it's like, you didn't have that for so long. That's what you were kind of yearning for. Yeah. And, and what I get to do is because of the area I live, it's there's a lot of poverty and these kids aren't, you know, they really have, it's a long shot for them to get out of here and, and experience college. And that's what I can say to them. And it doesn't matter if it's a Division One USC or if it's a Division Three school in New Mexico. It does not sure. matter to go and be around other young people that are coming from all over the world and experience that. It was the most fun I've ever had until now was college. And um, what I'm implementing in this community, because they don't have anything for young, like eight-year-olds to 12-year-olds. and it's not tackle football. I, I would love to stand on a mountain where America could hear me and say, child, from that those ages, brains aren't developed. This is facts. And we're putting helmets on them that give them a false sense of security. And we're having and we're encouraging them to run into each other is insane. It needs to be stopped. And I'm 100 percent serious. And what's the alternative? Flag football. It's great. You learn fundamentals. You have fun. You score touchdowns. You make interceptions. You have camaraderie with your teammates. It is the answer. And I hope it's the ignorance of people that you do not understand. Because, Clint, I have lost five of my closest friends on the USC Rose Bowl team because of this serious freaking CTE brain damage. And that is becoming public knowledge, finally. But still, people aren't talking about it. So how can we lessen the brain damage? Stop playing tackle football for children. Sorry to get on a soapbox, but I feel strongly about it. 
And I don't think that's controversial at all. In fact, we've had Chris Nowinski on our show, who's a leading uh, neuroscientist uh, from University of Harvard, who was in the WWE. And uh, obviously he's been at the forefront of a lot of these studies. So this is something that we are also uh, in on. And I think that you've, and that's, that's not a big ask to me. To, so you think yeah. at the high school level, that's when maybe it would it would start, like at 14. And it's super tough being a father, and I'm experiencing it. My son, Baron, of course he wants to play tackle football his whole childhood. And I just said, no, it's not an option. And as he got closer to high school, I went, holy shit. It's now, it's next year. And how I feel about that, the rules are changing. They are protecting the heck out of the quarterback. Um, it's not like I flip when I played, thank God. Um, so is it safe? No, but is it safer? Yes. And he wants to do it. And Clint, I tried to redirect my son his whole childhood. I gave him a golf club, a basketball, a baseball. And he was just like, bah, bah, football. So we're here. He starts uh, spring, uh, summer football in a month here in Hawaii. And Nobody will know who he is. And that's the way it should be when you're a freshman. Man, that, that, and it, to take the steps that you've taken and to, to do this. And it says a lot about kind of what you went through and in, in your childhood and basically just going a different direction. And that is just, that's learning from something that was traumatic for you in a lot of ways. There was a lot of trauma behind my childhood and I am at peace with that. And you know what? It took. I want to say 53 years, but that's as long as I've been on the planet. So not quite 53, but since I've been trying uh, repetitively to get sober. And if there's a message that I have for people, because we have an epidemic going on in our country and people are dying at an alarming rate. And it's this opiate opioid epidemic with fentanyl, to be blunt. And 100,000 people have died in the last 12 months. So. The only thing that I can say is I suffer from this thing. And the only thing that I have done is I keep trying recovery. And that's the people that finally adopt this lifestyle is the ones that keep trying. And if if you're out there and you're struggling with this thing, there is a solution. That's all I've got to say. Because you look at me and you're saying, this guy is freaking not on drugs. And I don't have to wear it on my shirt. It's coming from a light is coming from here and it's, it's attracting people. And if they ask me questions, I can be completely honest. And because of the internet, I'm over at the local high school and I bring them all in and give them a little background about my story. And I tell them I was with the Raiders, all rookie team. And then you know what happened? They all said at the same time, drugs happened. Yes, <laughs> that's what happened. And they didn't know me from Adam. But this internet thing is in your hand. It's a pocket computer, and you can find out anything about anybody. And I am not, I'm a complete open book, and I can share. If these kids want to know about that part of my life, I get to share that with them. Because even though I'm on an island, drugs are running rampant here, too. And that you bring up just some really poignant things and the fentanyl thing scares me. I don't have kids, Todd, but just the idea of it. And the, uh, I, I, it's uncertain to me. Like what, I don't know, like what, what could it affect me somehow? Just it's in stuff. They're putting it in stuff. They're poisoning our country. Where, when, when does it end? How do you get control of it? As when we were young, um, there was a thing called recreational drug use. That is, there is no recreational anymore about it because if you're thinking you're doing a bump of something that might raise your heart rate, you're dead. You don't know. Mm. That's, that's the super scary thing, especially having a 13 and 11 year old and being a dad. And so all is that, all I can do is um, lead by example, share my experience with them, and then get out of their way. Well. Todd, I have to say the timing of you moving, there is one aspect of it that is sort of unfortunate. And that is that I know a couple of years ago when uh, you went back uh, to, to USC, you went back to a game. Now we got Caleb Williams there. We've got Lincoln Riley there. Things are looking up for the Trojans just in time for you to, to go to Hawaii. So you're going to have to watch your Trojans from afar. But man, talk about a program on the rise. Caleb Williams, that's a guy I wish, especially uh, as a fellow, as a left-handed quarterback, somebody that I, uh, 
I feel like another person that you could be mentoring. Wow, what a player and fun to watch. I took my son, Baron, to watch him live, and we got there early. And that's the only place, I think, left where I can go and people recognize me. <laughs> so it's kind of cool because my son's there, and um, people are super kind at the Coliseum. Um, but we got there early, and so we see all these players getting off the bus, and they're in their street clothes. And Caleb walks by, and you you can't really see this on TV, but when you see him in person, you look at his lower body, he looks like a freaking running back and from the waist down. And now it made sense to me like that, how many tackles that guy breaks in the pocket. He's just running through guys and making it look easy and um, bringing back Trojan football, which is super cool. I, I love it. And I, you know, Lincoln Riley, of course, was at o- Oklahoma here. And as a Missouri fan, dealt with him enough times. And <laughs> so he's out there. He he went and built a home out in hot West Hollywood or out in the Hollywood Hills. So yeah. he's out of the Midwest and doing great things. And Caleb Williams. So, you know, here in Kansas City, Todd, I we got this guy named Patrick Mahomes here yeah. in Kansas City. Yeah. Things are going well. And I never thought I'd live to see the day because when you were playing against the Chiefs, it was, you know, the Steve DeBergs of the world, the Dave Craigs, and then finally, you know, Joe Montana. And it was always journeyman quarterbacks. And I just, I never thought I would see the day that the Chiefs were in the position they are. What's it like to watch a guy like Patrick Mahomes play? He's changed the game. I Mm. mean, at the quarterback position and being a quarterback, watching him. And there's a few that are in his class. I think um, Buffalo's guy is what a stud he is too but back to Mahomes the way he can throw with his body in any position and his arm angle in any angle and he's never out of it I mean that's the guy even though he's a chief I mean I I have sour grapes with the Chiefs because I never beat the Chiefs um but super fun to watch man and, and I really don't have a team I'm a fan of the player and if that's the case, man, I tune in when the Chiefs play just to see what he's going to do next. And then that that's entertainment. I, I mean, come on, at its highest level. Todd, to be frank with you, one of my first memories of football as, as a Chiefs fan was the ill-fated six-turnover Raiders-Chiefs <laughs> playoff game. And I, I remember like being kind of obsessed with you because like I saw this guy, number 12, and he's left-handed and like hair kind of sticking out the back and kind of this red blonde hair. And I'm like, Oh my God, I don't know. This guy looks, this guy's going to be good. And uh, I think the chiefs said that we, we had beat you guys like a, the week before then rematched in the playoffs. And so you have to come back to Arrowhead and just, it's, it's a turnover crazed game. I think you guys had six turnovers in the game and a 10 to six game. Yes. And that's the only time the chiefs and Raiders have ever played in the playoffs since uh, 1969. That was the, wow. the only time it ever happened. What's your wow. memories of that game? Go. Oh, I wish I could get them out of my head. Um, <laughs> Sorry, I just keep bringing them up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm teasing because the week before we had him in the Coliseum on grass. And that's why I think turf should be in our day and age. We can go grow grass inside, outside. It should be all on grass because the game changes. And so we went to Arrowhead, played the same defense. Nothing changed. But Derek Thomas coming off that corner on AstroTurf, let me tell you, he is cutting that corner with, like, inhuman ability. And then you have the crowd noise. And then I throw it to one player three times, a drawn cherry. And I think he retired after that. I would, too. Perfect, yeah. But even with all that, we had the ball down four with a couple minutes left. And we're we're kind of driving and then get three penalties and then end of story. But as a quarterback, that's all you want having an opportunity at the end to win the game. And so, um, yeah, it's a memory. I loved, I loved playing in away stadiums and I don't think any stadium was more of a challenge than Arrowhead. I think that still, you know, persists to this day (laughs) and of course everybody else has built like spaceship billion dollar stadiums you know not many teams have uh the classic stadiums remaining like uh lambo and 
uh, Kansas right. City, Soldier Field still uh, somewhat. They kind of renovated it there. But right. th- do you do you think that by then, by the time you're a rookie with the Raiders, that football had become just like so? It, it, it's almost like you'd reach that point, you'd reach the summit, you'd get drafted by the Raiders, and it, you, your football had been taken over your life for so long, and that you'd had so many traumatic experiences that football was almost like just a a job, like for some people, like just going to like an office and sitting in a cubicle. Did you, did, did you have that feeling at all at that point? <laughs> yes, you nailed it. I was done. I was done after I had a chance to practice with these guys um, and what an experience it was throwing on a daily basis against Ronnie Lott in the secondary. Come on. Yep. Um, lining up right over how we long. Um, and then turning around and handing it to Marcus, Eric Dickerson, and Roger Craig. And being around these guys and listening to what they said about my talent, I was like, all I wanted to do was play with the best at the highest level. And I didn't even really need to compete. I was just, I knew I belonged there because they were telling me I belonged there. And I was done. Uh, it, it totally makes sense in my mind. Do you feel like that from a young age, because I was this way, Todd, like whenever I was young, I, I don't know, I watched movies, I watched concerts, I watched MTV, I saw sports and I was like, I don't know what I'm going to do with my life. I'm probably not going to be an athlete, you know, look at me. 39, maybe I can give it a try now. But I was like, I have to do something in that world. Nine to five jobs, I can't do it. Yeah. There's no way. Like, I, I can't spend a uh, night shift at the plastics factory ever a day in my life. So I knew from a young age that I was different. I've never been married. I've never had kids. I was always driven by these, just these passions of mine. And cool. it sounds like you were that way too. But football was sort of woven in there as, yes, a passion, but also it became your plastics factory, so to speak. <laughs> And really when, um, looking back, because going through it, I didn't see any of it. Um, but how many people in our country uh, are brought up in a family or a family business? And all I wanted to do was be close to my dad. And whatever he did, he could have been a surf instructor. That would have been super cool. But he was a football player and a football coach. And so what I wanted to do was be around him. And then when he asked me when I was eight, what do you want to do? It was like, duh, I want to be a football player. And I, who knows if I really wanted that or I just wanted approval from him. And I think a lot of people can relate to that. And then once that ball started rolling, it was like a runaway train. And in high school and being recruited in this, I couldn't bow out. I mean, there was no stopping it. And so I was like, I just, I'll, I'll, I'll ride it out. And I'm glad I did because going, like I said, I get to share it with these kids about going to college. I, I think that experience is priceless and I'm a dropout. It's not like I got fucking got a degree from SC, which probably would have been helpful because um, this Trojan family, especially in the business world, runs strong on the West Coast. Um, but I didn't. And it's really all about the experience. I mean, I didn't play. For, I didn't even play long enough to get a pension in the NFL. Would that have been nice? Yeah. But. For me, it was about about the experience. And with this experience, I get to share it with others and maybe redirect their life. I think USC owes you at least like an honor, an honorary degree. You know, they do that for some good. Cele- <laughs> I think they owe you that at least. I mean, like, have you come back and have Patrick Muldoon there? He still, hair still looks good. He can, I I'm a think I'm an outside the box thinker, Todd. I, I'm just Man, push for that. That would be sweet. Well, speaking <laughs> of surf instructor, being a surf instructor, you're pretty good, right? So I'm coming to Hawaii in March. M- maybe you could show me a thing or two because I always feel like I, it's something I have to do, probably for bad reasons because I've seen Point Break too many times. <laughs> but I have to do it. Could you get an average idiot from Missouri? out there and within a day like get them to at least catch a wave or two with feeling pretty good about themselves sure could you do that dude it's a feeling that's like really none other i think two of my favorites is uh flowing on water and that's surfing and then frozen water so snowboarding there's freaking nothing like um it is harder than it looks like most 
I mean, I find that out when I play golf because watching these golfers on TV, I'm like, I think I can do that until I go out there and try to hit. And the ball ain't even moving, and it's still super hard. So the best people make it look easy. And um, But you know what? Being in the water is a win. I don't even have to catch a wave because I always feel when I get out of the ocean, I feel better than when I got in. And so, yes, it's a bonus when you catch a wave or two, but it's all about just getting in the water. How does the how does the surf compare in Hawaii to to like some of the beaches in L.A. and stuff like that? <laughs> Not even a comparison, right? No. And the thing, the big thing is, my favorite beach I hit on the way back from practice on a daily, and I've only seen one surfer in the water in three months. That I mean, it is one of the most spectacular black fin beaches that I've ever been to in the world and without a soul on it. And that is, that is priceless. What, uh, you, that's on the big Island, right? You're on the big Island. I yeah. Can't which Island? You, no, you go, <laughs> you are not the specific beach. I'm just saying like a general that's somewhere on the big. Yeah, island. It's the big. Island. <laughs> yeah. That, so you, you want to uh, make sure that stick. Cause like in the movie point break, they had like the surf, gang that was there and it's like if you serve someone else's break man they were like kicking somebody's ass keanu reeves and stuff so <laughs> what a great movie that was though. that's like my main focus in life i'm like god just like patrick swayze was so cool and had the long hair and he starts like I, I don't know this is like a spiritual thing and like you're kind of a spiritual person you sort of like yeah. you've always been like you you're you, you're a skateboarder like but you're you you're an la guy there was something about that like Growing up in Missouri, we I was just like, I don't even know what that stuff is. It's just cold all year. And <laughs> the California vibe, man, it's sort of in you. You sort of had that. You were like pro probably playing like, you know, uh, Rad Racer on Nintendo and like Excite Bike and stuff. You had that in you all along, didn't you? <laughs> I, um, well, I'm definitely a California beach kid. And um, I don't know how I survived uh so many years because I knew that uh, it just became too crowded and with crowd brings just brings a lot that uh, affects the spirit and so this move was for my son Baron however I have uh, grown and flourished in this environment that um, it's undeniable and oh. so people say about well it, it's there's so many different variables how somebody can thrive, but man, environment's got to be up on the top of the list. Todd, I tell you, I, I can't, I can't thank you enough for, for your time. And let's definitely not wait five years in between doing this again, <laughs> because I, you know, the, the truth be told is, um, I, I just kind of emotional having you here and just seeing you in the state, because I've often thought of you over the years and, you know, I don't know if it means anything or if it's, you know, I, but I, I've prayed for you. I've thought about you. You're, you're somebody that's, I, I just feel a kinship to you're a great guy. And I, to see you in this state, like makes me, like I'm been kind of emotional this whole interview, to be honest with you. Clint, I appreciate it. And I feel that. And I get, I get chills. And in Hawaii, they call it chicken skin. And I never get this goosebumps, chicken skin or God bumps on a lie. And um, when you said prayer, I truly believe, that's the only reason why I'm still here on the planet because my behavior, I shouldn't be here. And there are so many people that have prayed for me that I don't even know. And, um, I believe that that there is power in prayer. And like you said, I'm not a religious person, but I have found something that has intervened between me and this old lifestyle that is so real. I can feel it that, um, I don't need to even label it. It's freaking undeniable. And we'll leave it at that. Yeah, right. And that's, I almost hesitated to use the word prayer because I didn't want to bring kind of that no. into it. For But that's, for me, that's what it was. And that's. I pray daily and I talk to my creator daily. And if there's one thing that I could be the most powerful thing that I do on a daily basis is pray. Todd, I'm um, going to look you up here uh, in March when we head over to, to Hawaii. Can't wait to do it. You continued success and continue. And I can't wait to 
be kept up, uh, have you keep up uh, with Baron with us and let you know how he's doing and how his career is pr progressing and how awesome. he has doing out there because uh, the, your, your purpose in life, I think is you see it and it's now set. And I think that that is a tremendous thing. So Todd, cool. continued success, my friend. Thank you again. And we'll, uh, we'll do it again soon. My brother. Thank you. Aloha buddy. You bet. Thank you.